Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I'm Matthew Lucas. And we post a video every week. We do. So come on board and subscribe. And if you want to know when the next video is coming up, don't forget to press the alert button. And you'll hear all about our latest horticultural adventures. And Mr. Ryan, it's a little chilly this week. What could we possibly be doing? <laughs> Funnily enough, going to Chile. No. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we're going to go and have a look at a plant that comes from the forests of Chile. Oh, okay, let's go. So off we go. This is like an episode of Play School, Stephen. We're <laughs> sitting on cushions on the floor. Shall yes. we begin? Let's do just that. Yes, we had to get down low because this plant is in flower near ground level. So and it is extraordinary. This is by your drive and mm. it is, it's so eye-catching. The colours. Yeah, Tell us everything. All right, for a start, we already know it comes from Chile. Yeah. And apparently there's a form that also grows on Pitcairn Island. Right. For a long time. Pitcanensis. Yes, Pitcanensis. Oh. Or possibly Pitcanii. I can't remember which way around it went, but anyhow, it doesn't matter. The powers that be have decided there is only one species. Yes. But there would seem to be two forms in cultivation, and we will show you later on the other form because I've got both forms in the garden of here. Of course you have. Yeah, and they're they're quite different in their growth patterns. Is the other one in bloom? No, I don't think we're going to see it in flower, but it's the growth patterns. The flowers are basically the same when it flowers, but right. uh, it's the growth pattern that is quite different. So it has quite a different sort of habit. This one I would assume is Fascicularia bicolor subspecies bicolor. <laughs> now, look, I know you understand all that malarkey, but the whole subspecies thing, I mean, why would a plant have a name like that? What does it, what does it mean? In, right. in simple person's <laughs> talk, Stephen, all help right. me understand. The, the problem is that sometimes there will be slight variations within a species. Mm. The uh, taxonomists and botanists don't believe that there's enough separation to actually then erect another species I so see. it's close enough to the normal form right. so therefore if there's say two or more forms of something out there that they still think are the same species then they'll sometimes give it a subspecies status but wouldn't couldn't you also call it a form you could the, the terms can be a little interchangeable right uh, so the uh, authorities I use tend to use the term subspecies some others might use form some would use variety even you know so you know so it's all a little interchangeable and confusing and confusing anyway, but anyhow getting that. yes getting back to fascicularia the name translates as bundles so the flowers are in bundles yep. so I assume that's how it works bicolor of course means two colored that's reasonably simple yeah. and the flowers are actually these beautiful blue bits right in the middle mm. uh, in this bundle and what this plant does is when it flowers its leaves uh, turn bright red to attract pollinators to the blue flowers so it becomes more florally interesting because the leaves change color so and it yeah. is it is like a flashing red light i mean um we'll show you closer but as you walk past it is it literally draws your yeah. focus to the center yeah. so I imagine the pollinator, is the pollinator going to respond to the red, do you think? Yes, because uh, this could well be a hummingbird uh, pollinated plant and birds see red really well. Mm. So there's a good chance that the birds are lured in by the red leaves, but then because it's in the center, they get attracted to the center of the plant and then they find the nectar source that they want in inside. Now, we haven't mentioned though, yes. I have to say, we've <laughs> talked about the name of the plant, but what you need to know is that it's actually a bromeliad, so it's in the same family as the commercial pineapple. Mm -hmm. um, really? Yes, that's a bromeliad as well. Is it? Yes, oh, there's, there's your little brain ticking over it now, is. I can tell. It yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it is also probably the most cold hardy of all of the bromeliads. And you've alluded in the past, we've looked at some of your bromeliads, yep. but no one's really done a lot of work on figuring out what is the sort of the minimum temperatures a lot of bromeliads can go. But this one, yep. you know. Yeah, this one, you can see it growing in gardens in the south of England. You can see it growing in gardens in colder parts of North America. I'm sure you could grow it in the garden in Portland, Oregon. So it's one of those plants that uh, people love to grow in the cooler climates where they're in zonal denial so that they they, they have this sort of tropical-esque look. Zonal denial? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, I've got a lot of friends in America who are absolute plant geeks and they're perfectly happy admitting that they're in zonal denial. Because it does look, it looks very hot climate, it looks mm. very cactusy, so it would give a, a huge dollop of exoticism in a oh, yeah. garden. Mm. So just on that point then, what is its hardiness range, do you think? Well, I'm not sure about zone-wise, but it will certainly cope with quite a few degrees of frost and it's also comparatively drought and heat tolerant. So, But it, does, it doesn't even blink when we have a drought. Drought. It doesn't seem to like full sun. It seems to grow and flourish better where it's got plenty of light but not much direct sunlight. Having said that, I've seen it growing out in the sun too. So it's it's a very adaptable plant. Very adaptable. And, and how curious. Now in Chile, what's its native environment there? Uh, it will grow in rock banks, cliffs, uh, all sorts of areas that so are very it, heavily drained. Is it essentially an epiphyte then, like many bromeliads? No, it's more a lithophyte than a, an epiphyte. Oh, we so, love <laughs> lithophytes. Well, I do anyway. Yeah, yeah, so it's more one of them. Now, I have to say this form will make a big colony and we'll show you some sort this of... This clump is huge now after 10 or 15 years. It goes way over to there and it clambers all the way over through the rock garden over to there and right back into the bamboo clump behind. It just keeps slowly growing sideways. So it produces sort of new pups, which are new plants. Yep, and bomb, yep. bomb, bomb. And when one finishes flowering, that will then eventually die. So right. that actual crown will die. But of course, it's been producing new ones all the time. So it's, it's going sideways the whole time. So can we talk about the flower? Um, Blue flowers of the Holy Grail, are they not in botany? They do tend to be. Like, would and you it say is a, that's blue or I'd is say it that's violet? A, no, I'd say that's a true blue. It hasn't got any of the red in it that you would expect from uh, a bluey purpley thing. So it's a blue, but it's a very rich dark blue. And the combination with the red of the, the leaves is just amazing. So the red colouring only happens when the flower's emerging. Yep. Otherwise, it's always grey just green. Straight, just straight green foliage on the non-flowering crowns. And... We did a program about monocarps, mm. which the plant lives to bloom and then it dies. Yeah. Is this a monocarp? No. Because this, this branch is going to die yeah. when it blooms, yeah. but... But the plant isn't going to. But the to. plant isn't, yeah. right. Yeah, so a monocarp, strictly the speaking, the whole plant will die after it finishes doing its thing. That's it. That's it. Mm. And it either will produce seed or bulbils that will take on the next generation. This doesn't need that because it is, in fact... Um, only going to lose that crown and most bromeliads work in the same way the flowered crowns die but they have pups coming up around them that take over uh, and this plant has been doing its thing here in the rock garden for about 20 years and how many blooms have you had this one <laughs> so, so congratulations <laughs> mr ryan yes. on the birth of your beautiful bromeliad flower <laughs> yes exactly so they don't always take that long to bloom it's just this clump has seemed to be quite reticent why, to flower. Why do you think that could be? Well, maybe it's not getting quite enough light. Maybe mm. that's the issue. But anyhow, it's happy enough. It's grown well. I ignore it all the time. I don't do anything to it. I don't mm. water it. I don't feed it. I don't prune it. I don't do anything to it at all. Mm. And I propagate it just by breaking away young crowns, cleaning up the bottom of the cut, plonking them in the ground and, and selling them ruthlessly yeah well hopefully hopefully in fact selling them ruthlessly ruth. so um, that, was, that was going to be my other question about propagation um does it produce viable seed i guess it must do uh, i'm assuming it would uh some of the bromeliads are quite slow from seed to get them up to a viable plant yeah so if i can just grow the pups but then i'm happy to do that but i have to say the other form of the species makes a really dense clump and all of the crowns tend to stuck are stuck together and I've tried to divide one of those and it hasn't worked. Ah. So, so the other form could be a problem. So should we go and have a look at that now, the problem child? Yes. Why don't we go off and have a look at the other form and I can show you the difference between the two different subspecies. Uh, and yes, you can see why it's going to be a much more difficult plant to produce. Okay, off we go. That means getting up. <laughs> Matthew, here yes. we are in front of or next to the other form of fascicularia and can i just say as a non-botanist looking at this it look i mean obviously they look vaguely similar but completely different the leaf yep the form the show figure <laughs> <laughs> are you crazy botanist yeah you? i mean i personally would have thought that they should have had specific status instead of subspecific status but having said that too of course 
botanists work by flowers more than they do by foliage and structure. Mm. So the flowers of this form may well be so similar to the other form we've just looked at that they can't see the difference. So therefore, even though the foliage and the plant is a bit different, I mean, if you look at the leaves of the two different forms, here I have the one that we looked at earlier. Here's the other form, which is apparently now Fascicularia bicolor caniculata. They are quite different to look at. And so it just goes to show that species in the wild can be very diverse. They're not standard. And does this come from the same kind of uh, areas as the other one? In Chile? This one is supposed to be the Pitcairn Island form. Right. So this would have at some stage or another been Fascicularia pitcanifolia or Pitcanensis or however it worked. Mm. So it's now been lumped in with the other one. It makes a much tighter clump. It's virtually impossible to divide. Mm. So I've struggled to try and grow more of it. And in fact, these plants I bought from a grower and they'd actually been grown by tissue culture. So they tissue cultured them right. and I grew and I got them as young plugs that have been grown as tissue culture. And has yours ever bloomed this one? This one hasn't but I've got a friend who's got the same clone in his garden and it has in fact flowered. And in terms of the similarity of flower? Yeah the, the only difference I could tell was that the red on this form tends to come up the leaves a bit further than it does on the broader leafed form mm. so but the flowers themselves were identical possibly smaller so the flower head's a little smaller, so everything mm. about the plant is a little bit sort of daintier and smaller. It looks it, yeah. And it's not as bitey. So no, it's, it's not, not, not as prickly. It's not as spiky. Yeah. So it would have separated, obviously the Pitcairn Islands have separated millennia ago. Yeah, well, exactly. Of years ago, so the cousins have been separated for quite some time. They have. So can I assume this has the same sort of growing likes and dislikes as the other one? In terms it of seems to. Sun, cold mm. tolerant, drought tolerant. Yep seems to have all the same characteristics it's just slower growing and of course doesn't make a big colony because it doesn't tend to send out stems that produce a new rosette on the end it seems to have all its rosettes crammed together in one sort of clump so it doesn't grow as wide and age wise is this about the same vintage as the other one or is it younger i'd say these are a bit younger by a couple of years or so because uh, i've had that one for a long long time i got it from a garden out in the western districts of victoria masses of years ago I don't even remember exactly when and I've been dividing and propagating it and so forth ever since these ones I got sometime in the last five to six years probably okay yeah but I'm just observing over here oh, to my yes. untrained eye another spiky leaf that doesn't look dissimilar but it's twice as tall yes is well, that we, related yes well, we might just finish off with a little look at another cold hardy bromeliad relative from south america why not indeed let's do that all right let's go well at least we're standing up now mr ryan <laughs> yes yes the sitting down was getting a bit much and this has to be the tallest bromeliad that i can grow in my cool climate it's from chile and i've seen it growing in the wild in sort of edges of forests and things so it's yep. definitely a terrestrial one and it's in the genus grigia uh, sphacelata is the species name its flowers are completely inconspicuous <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, they hide right down in the, the base of the plant. They're bluish, but you would it would flower and finish, and you'd never know it had happened. Mm. So its flowers are of no importance. So, million dollar question, why do you grow it, Stephen ah, Ryan? I like its tall textural quality. It is slightly spiky along the edges, so it you do is. have to be careful about that. But I like its fresh greenness. I think it's a really interesting plant. And of course, for me, because it's sort of an oddity of a plant, mm. it sort of attracts my attention just because here I have a cold hardy bromeliad that I can grow in my shady, dryish garden without even thinking about it. It just sits there and keeps growing. And I must say, it is really striking. It's sort of on the corner of a path and it's very sculptural if spiky i also like the way that the leaves sort of naturally kink yes, at the they, end. yes so they sort of have a nice sort of curl over on them and uh, it's quite an elegant habit yeah i think it's a rather pretty plant so it's never going to be a popular garden center plant it's probably never going to be a particularly popular garden plant but having said that i quite like it and so therefore it has every right to be here because i like it so two questions then well actually many questions firstly similar growing conditions as the other two yeah it's perfectly happy in cold dry, is, shade. dry shade yeah it seems to be sun. about as cold tolerant as the other certainly in my climate it is yep. it may not be quite as cold hardy in 
much colder climates as the um, fascicularias are, but certainly I've seen it growing in fairly damp, soggy forest edges in southern Chile yeah. and quite cold and miserable sort of conditions, edges of beach forests and things down there, and looking fantastic, just these great big clumps of strappy leaves. Do you bother propagating it? If it's I haven't bothered. Uh, uh, I was given it by somebody who just gave it to me as a, I think, unrooted rosette, mm. uh, so it should be easy enough to propagate. But because it's got sort of minimal usages, I guess, in most people's gardens, mm. I haven't actually bothered trying to propagate it, but I will at some stage and then it can sit around the nursery and not sell. <laughs> Put your requests below. <laughs> yes, exactly, yes. I might start growing it if I have enough people who are interested. Well, Stephen, I've because I, I really love bromeliads. I don't know why I find them fascinating. They're mm. Well, they're and often a, very tough. Yeah, they're very tough. And one thing we haven't mentioned throughout this whole story about mm. fascicularias and others is that bromeliads apparently, albeit in some cases minimally, have edible fruit. They all have edible berries uh, going right up to the pineapple. Ah, so well, you can eat them. that makes logical sense. But I've, I'm just trying to remember when my other bromeliads have flowered, what sort of what eaty bit what edible bit yeah, be. it should be a little probably mainly yellowish berry oh, okay. that they will produce and well, i've never tried them no but i'm sure there are people out there that have and so they can get back in touch with us and tell us how delicious or otherwise the fruit of other bromeliads are but i have read that they're all edible there you go so well you go. watch this space but i shan't be the one testing the theory i will now i've loved this deep delve into the bromeliads of chile with a slight diversion to pitcairn island we're actually in the middle of creating a Chilean plant film over the seasons because you've got a lot of Chilean plants and yeah. Chile just has this extraordinary botany, doesn't it? It is. It's, uh, its plant diversity is remarkable and it has a lot of endemics that are really, really interesting garden plants. Mm. And yeah, why in fact shouldn't we actually create a whole Chilean film? Well, we will. So watch this space and it will probably go to air in winter when the last... Um, of the plants that we're waiting on blooms. So until then though, you're gonna to have to hit subscribe to find out what we're doing each week. And next week, Stephen, what could it be? It could be almost anything, uh, because as those who follow us know, we go to gardens, we do plant profiles, we do practical things, we do all sorts of stuff. So it could be any one of those. So hit subscribe if you're keen to see what else we might be doing. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye all.